to the power of God, I, I don't know, but there are people God is raising to become mighty vessels. I just saw an anointing rest on you, this role. In the name of Jesus, I don't know where you are, but I pray may that grace now, let it rest upon you and shift you to a new dimension. In the name of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Christocentric Message. On this channel, you are going to get soul-lifting messages, faith-based content, prayer drills, and videos that would help you grow spiritually. Remember to subscribe to the channel, like the video you are about to watch, and comment on it. We started by examining the gospel, just a one or two minutes recap. And um, I did say how that the gospel has two expressions or two dimensions that there is the message and there is the ideology there is the message that saves a revelation of the father's love revealed and demonstrated in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of jesus man and creation being the object the recipients of that love and then there is the ideology that transforms we'll look at that um, hopefully by the evening and we started a journey examining the the entire discourse the theology of redemption and the gospel and we stopped somewhere and prayed yesterday i would just like to finish that up and then we'll quickly go into today's discussion um the Bible says in John chapter 3 from verse 16, this was a discussion with Nicodemus that led to that scripture. In fact, we'll read from 15 to 18. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a man sent from God, for no man can do these things except God be with him. Verse 3 of John 3, Jesus replies and says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And then Nicodemus says, shall a man in his old age enter back into his mother's womb to be born anew? And Jesus says in verse 5, I say unto you again, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom. Hallelujah. And then the discussion continued. He said that which is spirit is spirit that which is flesh is flesh the wind blow it where it listed you cannot tell where it's going or where it's coming so is one who is led of the spirit by the time we get to verse 15 john 3 now and verse 15 jesus began to talk to him about the need and the necessity for salvation that everyone who does not um receive of this gift is already condemned then verse 16 it says for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son now you must understand for us today when we are really translating that scripture he's no longer his only begotten son he was his only begotten son as at the time jesus would die today he is the first begotten of we the brethren the bible says is that true it says behold what manner of love the father has bestowed upon us in that we are now called the sons of god he says now are we the sons of god and it doth not yet appear what we shall be like so for us today he's not his only begotten son he is the first begotten of we the brethren hallelujah he says that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life i made a statement yesterday that i would want to just pick up from there the word eternal life was not a very accurate translation now i know that um, for many people who have had the time to study theology you would know that when the bible was being uh, translated the Old Testament was largely written in Hebrews and then the New Testament was a combination of Greek and Aramaic. And in translating the Bible, um, there were certain words that 
based on the principles of translation, they would have to use the best expression that captured the essence of that word. So the translators chose the word eternal or everlasting. But in truth, that is not the kind of life Jesus gave us. The life he gave us is beyond everlasting and eternal because everybody has, please don't mistake in what I'm saying, everybody has everlasting life. Everybody lives forever. Whether you spend eternity in hell or heaven, you will continue to live. So the life he gave us is beyond everlasting. It is called from the Greek word zoe. It is God's very life. The life of God is not just talking about the longevity of the life, but the quality of the life. Are we together now? This is the life that Jesus came to give. And Apostle John again was speaking and he said, this is the record or the testimony that God has given us this life. But he structured the administration of that life such that until you encounter the son, you cannot have that life. That means you cannot say you are a recipient of eternal life today outside of the son. This is very important because there are many people today who have not met Jesus, but they would propose that they have eternal life. The Bible says, no man cometh to the Father except by me. So if it is true that you have eternal life, it must also be true that you have met the Son. That there is no other name under heaven given unto men by which we should be saved. So the foundation of the the believer's journey, listen very carefully please, the foundation of the believer's journey is not coming to church. The foundation of the believer's journey is not buying a Bible. The foundation of a believer's journey is not reciting a prayer or some creed. The foundation of the believer's journey is a personal encounter with Jesus. No matter how you've been around church or religious activities, if, if you have not had an encounter with Jesus, then you are not a recipient of eternal life. You can be around the things of the kingdom. You can be well-meaning, well-intentioned. But you have to understand this, that the foundation for the believer's, the believer's progress and his work is Jesus. I am the way, he said. I am the truth. And I am the life. He says, no man cometh to the Father but by me. Are we together now? I say this because we live in a world that is very complex. Last I checked, it was about 4,000 plus religions in our world today. I hope you are aware of that. 4,000 religions and for many of us, because of uh, our territory is limited to about three or four in, in Nigeria, we largely have Christianity, Islam, and then traditional worship and different variations there. You may not see the necessity of this foundation, but when you find yourself in a location where Christianity accounts for maybe 2% of the entire population, you will be surprised that there are people who have never heard about Jesus as much as you know and love him. And in proposing Jesus to them, you have to let them understand that when it comes to the faith life, Jesus is the only way. Because there are many religions where there are many ways. The most important thing is the consciousness and the state you attain, not the person you are loyal to. So when they come into the faith life, they assume that their experience of many options is so, even with the faith life. Whether you come from the north, south, east or west, the central point of convergence for the believer is Jesus, not church. You can be loyal to a church, but if you don't have an encounter with Jesus, you are not a Christian. It's as simple and as honest as that. Hallelujah. What is in the message? Let me wrap up with this. I'm wrapping up yesterday's teaching. What is in the message? Why is it so powerful? I hope you know that when Satan attacks a church, when Satan attacks a man of God, when Satan attacks missionaries and Christian families, he is not attacking individuals. Satan only fights one thing, the message. 
you read the story of the early church all that was attacked was the make sure that that message does not go out because there is something within that message that sustains the power to liberate are we together now when jesus came and walked upon the earth the threat was not his personality the threat was not the speaking the threat was the message the early church every time they were bound and kept in prison it was on account of the message are we together yes so what is in the message what does the message deliver to one who receives number one contained in the message is the revelation of the love of God please write it down love contained in the message of salvation is love which the Bible says is the cure to fear first John 4 and verse 18 that when you receive the message you're not just receiving eternal life as we know there are many other components first John 4 and verse 18 love that is the first thing you receive first John 4 and verse 9 also media do we have okay just write for reference and if we can use KJV that would be fine thank you so much love the cure to fear please look up the spirit of fear is a very dangerous spirit every other spirit waits for fear to act I hope you realize that every other spirit is impotent and incapacitated until fear opens the door any door that fear does not open no other spirit can access fear is that powerful and so the Bible says to deliver those who through the fear of death have all their lifetime been subjected to bondage it says there is no fear in love but perfect love sustains the ability to cast out fear fear of death fear of the future fear of tomorrow fear of the past fear of today hallelujah our fear is gone that when we receive that message in it is immunity against fear because it gives us the confidence to know like Paul will say that for me to live is Christ and even in death I am victorious I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God hallelujah love perfect love cast out fear do you know medical science would teach us and, and, and this church has brilliant and exceptional people even in that practice medical science would teach us that when you can simulate an environment of love itself is therapeutic to the patient without administering any drug am I right on that Yes, that there are people who literally plunge to depression. In fact, right now, medical science is learning that more than administering drugs and treatments, there are many people who their medical state is a side effect of the absence and the bankruptcy of that atmosphere of love over a prolonged period of time. Love. I define love as the absence of self more than just a feeling of pleasantness love is the absence of self you can measure the presence of love by the absence of self and you can measure the absence of love by the presence of self love in my definition in its purest definition is the absence of self he says greater love had no man than this than a man laid down his life what is in the message number two peace what do you find in that message when you receive it why do we labor day and night making sure that the nations get this message in that message is the peace peace with God and then the peace of God Romans 5 and verse 1 peace with God you know what it means to have peace with God 
that means there is no barrier that stands Romans 5 and verse 1 peace with God that if I stand before him I have been justified by faith he says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ that means there is no reason to be afraid that means there is nothing he has against me Jesus has paid the price I can stand blameless before the throne peace with God and then it advances to the peace of God Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 the peace of God there is a difference between peace with God and the peace of God peace with God and the peace of God please look up today we seek for peace in various ways how we need peace in our world today peace the absence of turbulence restfulness it says to be anxious for nothing the word careful there was an error in translation is the word anxiety be anxious for nothing it says but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God the next verse says and the peace of God the peace of God shall garrison or protect you it will keep your minds through Jesus Christ so you can be in the midst of challenging situations and yet like Jesus you can find peace in the boat you see there's I'm out of it already for thou art with me he says thy rod and thy staff they comfort me and in the midst of it that you prepare a table for me even in the midst of my enemies thy rod and thy staff they comfort me what is in the message peace with God and the peace of God number three what is in the message is God blessing someone already what is in the message salvation salvation is in the message it comes from the word to salvage to salvage means to rescue by taking the blame not just to rescue to rescue by is like a replacement you take one who is the defaulter and then you now pay that price that you should have paid there is salvation in the message very powerful salvation in the message Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter two, 4 and verse 12. It says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That means if you want to be saved, you cannot call the police can help the dss can help the military can help they can administer some form of salvation but salvation that affects your eternity only comes through jesus christ no angel can administer salvation no man of god sustains the power to administer salvation it only resides within the office of the christ are we together salvation romans chapter 10 and verse 13 Romans chapter 10 buttresses again on that Romans 10 13 he says brethren my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved it is my desire that they be saved what else is in the message deliverance please write it down what else is in the message deliverance Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. Colossians 1 and verse 13. Deliverance. What is deliverance? Deliverance is a system that brings a separation between you and the influence that impedes your peace and impedes your progress. Be it a spirit entity or any kind of influence. You can be delivered from conditions, not only spirits. Anything that can bring a separation. Are we together now? Yes. 
like a, a medical doctor will perform a surgery on a patient maybe with cancer or some kind of growth or tumor and and extract out with precision that limitation that process there is deliverance he's bringing a separation so there are people who don't need separations from any spirits but if you are separated from a wrong mindset it is deliverance also because that mindset is a condition that is keeping you bound hallelujah colossians 1 13 is that 13 did i get that right and had delivered us and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son so when you walk to an unbeliever please look up when you walk to an unbeliever to preach Jesus more than just responding to the call of a ministry to preach more than just honoring your call as a missionary or an evangelist you are proposing the aforementioned to that person that I am bringing you a message that delivers love, peace, salvation, deliverance. Are we together now? And finally, dominion. What is in the message? Dominion. That there is the restoration. There is the restoration of dominion. Romans 5.17 Romans 5 17 dominion remember yesterday in our discussion we said how that the among the three things that man lost he lost the Holy Spirit he lost righteousness and he lost dominion that mandate it says for if by one man's offense death reigned by one much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Revelations 5 and verse 10 says that we have been made unto our God kings and priests or a kingdom of priests and we shall reign in this life. Hallelujah. We must therefore trust God for grace like never before to see that this message gets to everyone. Every home must ensure that the people within that home have an opportunity to hear this message. Now, please look up. As powerful as this message is, there is no guarantee that the hearer will receive. Isn't it amazing that with all of this rich, the rich components captured in this message, that it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone who believes. People have a right that even God respects to reject Jesus. That means an individual can, as an act of his will, say, I have heard you, I sympathize with you, I even feel bad for you for laboring so much and speaking for so long, but I, as an act of my will, I reject Jesus. The Bible says, as many as received him, that means some will reject him. It is painful, but we have an assignment to see to it that we get this message. Now, let me tell you this. The primary assignment of the church as a local assembly is to become the point of convergence, number one, for sinners who are looking for Jesus Christ genuinely, and then for those who are now saved, who desire growth and maturity, which is my subtopic for this morning. This is what we are looking at now. The church is not a place for troublemakers, although they are invited. The church is not a place for unserious people, although they are invited. The church is not a place for politics, although everyone is welcome but primarily the church was an invention of God's intelligence as a local assembly now because the church is many things foundationally the church is a strategy not just a place the church is a spiritual strategy invented by God's own intelligence the strategy the only strategy on earth that sustains the power to subdue the gates of hell is called the church 
Number two, the church represents a people, those who are blood washed, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then number three, the church represents an institution. The only institution that sustains the power to build, to mature, to mentor, and to release believers. Hallelujah. So people can reject Jesus Christ, but it is our desire and our prayer that everyone we come across within our lifetime, that as we preach and talk about Jesus Christ, that they will embrace Jesus Christ genuinely. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. Now let's go to today's teaching. Wherever we stop again. Growth and maturity. That will be the second phase of our teaching. We're looking at equipping the saints. And we started looking at the foundation of the gospel. Um, now we we'll look at growth and maturity. I did say yesterday that the quality of believers within any territory is among other factors a report card, a testament of the kind and the quality of spiritual voices within that territory. Hallelujah. That means if you random pick believers across several denominations and probe them along the lines of spiritual things you are safe to conclude that the report from that assessment is a fair reflection of the spiritual understanding of the spiritual leaders within that territory. Africa is about the most loyal continent when it has to do with spirituality and religion. Nigeria particularly is uniquely graced with a high affinity for spiritual things. It doesn't matter whether we're in error or not. The fact that we have an appreciation for spiritual things is an advantage. Are we together now? That means if people are misled, territorially speaking, there is a major part of that blame that must come to the servants of God. It means there is something about our structure of mentorship and building that is producing a poor product. Is God helping us now? So let's look at the concept of growth and maturity. Because for many believers, sadly speaking, the moment they encounter Jesus, the Son, genuinely so, they believe that is all there is to the Christian experience. And so there are many people who come to church and there is no intention, there is no expectation for growth. In fact, you would be surprised that many believers do not even know that the possibility for spiritual growth exists. They just know that there should be a platform just to keep the ritual of spirituality going. And yet biology teaches us that something is wrong when an entity does not grow. Are we together? When a woman gives birth to a baby, it will be unfair to begin to flog the baby and say, will you run out of here? No, that's too early. But after one year, perhaps two years, and the baby is not walking, no signs of talking, the organs of expression don't seem to be alive, you take the child to the hospital, is that true? And you say, doctor, I think something is wrong. That means there are many believers who need to be on admission spiritually. Why? Because if we have been um, around the things of God for a long time, and our organs of expression as an understanding as far as our spiritual understanding is concerned, sadly, there are many believers that have not grown past the gate of redemption. Growth refers to increase. Please write. Growth refers to increase. Increase in size. Increase in capacity. Increase in convictions. Growth refers to increase in size, increase in capacity, increase in conviction. God expects believers in church to grow. You may want to write that down. That God expects believers in church to grow. 
Now, there are different levels of growth. As we know, there is biological growth, intellectual growth, career growth, financial growth, and even spiritual growth. The only kind of growth I know that is natural is biological growth. Every other kind of growth is initiated intentionally. You don't grow intellectually by default. You don't grow in career and profession by default. You also do not grow spiritually by default. Is God speaking to someone already? Write this down please. Growth and maturity is not necessarily determined by how long you have been around the church. Growth and maturity is not necessarily determined by how long you have been around the church. That means longevity in the house of God, as profitable as that is, does not automatically translate to growth and maturity. There are many people, respectfully speaking, who have been around the house of God. They have been around every program, every conference, every convention. They are friends with every man of God. And yet, they are genuine Christians, but there is no growth. And sometimes we pride ourselves that just because we are around spiritual activities, it automatically translates to growth. Not so. There were many people around Jesus and we see that there were people who did not grow. In fact, please look up. Those who were close to Jesus responded to his presence in various ways. Only few were changed by their intimacy with him. Others made money from his presence. Others used his presence as a ladder to be able to get fame and influence. Only a handful were transformed. So just don't tell me you are around Jesus. What are you doing around him? You can be using him as a business strategy to make money. You can be using him as a strategy to prove to people you are not a failure. And there are others who would come to him because he said, follow me and I will make you. He does not give you until he makes you. You have to understand this. For many people, when they come to Jesus, after the initial gift of salvation, he does not give you any other thing. It is making that follows. When he now makes you, he can empower you. The making part is where many believers have not easily submitted to. Spiritual growth is not necessarily determined by the frequency of church attendance and the observance of spiritual or religious activities. Don't get me wrong. They are profitable, but it does not necessarily mean that just because you are around church, in fact, you can even be a worker in church, respectfully speaking. But that does not automatically translate to growth and maturity. Is God helping us? Second Peter, please. Second Peter chapter 3 from verse 17 and 18. Apostle Peter has something to teach us here. Second Peter chapter 3 from verse 17 and 18. Second Peter 3. It says, Therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being oh dear, not sure I can see it well, with the error of the wicked, fall into your own steadfastness. The next verse. The next verse now, 18. Okay, let me just pull it up from here so that we'll save time. It says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge, thank you, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, grow. Grow in grace grow in grace. Luke chapter 2 and verse 52 it says and Jesus grew he increased even Jesus increased in wisdom the Bible says in stature and in favor Luke 2 52 increased in wisdom stature favor with God and with men. Apostle Paul in mentoring the church in Corinth 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when you read verse 11 he said when I was a child so he gave us certain indices to measure spiritual childishness. That there are exact indices, 13 and verse 11. When I was a child, 
So the first way you know you are a child is your speaking. I speak as a child. Number two, your level of comprehension or otherwise, I understood as a child. I thought as a child, which translates to your actions. You see that? Because your actions are a product of your thinking. He says, but when I became a man, I put away. So this morning, God is going to help us to put away childish things. In the name of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, Apostle Paul again speaking to the church in Corinth, he says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding him as in a mirror, he says we are changed from glory to glory. We are changed. We are changed from glory to glory. One dimension of glory to another. But that happens when we behold him as in a glass. Now, let me tell you this. There is a serious tragedy that will always come upon any believer who does not grow. And I will just list two of them very quickly. There is a side effect to not growing spiritually. Number one, the first side effect is found in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 18. Ephesians 4 and verse 18 it says having their understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart look at that scripture carefully having their understanding darkened it says being alienated from the life of God you know what this means that even though it is true that you are a recipient of eternal life but you see, the life you have received is powered through knowledge. So that in ignorance, although you are saved, you may not be able to walk in the experience of the potential that this life you have received brings. Are we blessed now? So I can be a Christian, a believer, and yet not experience all the things that the Bible says culminate to a victorious Christian life. I can still be oppressed by demon spirits. I can still be a failure. I can still be weak under the vicissitudes of life. I can still lack peace and joy, the fruit of the spirit not finding expression in my life. And even though I am a genuine Christian, why? Because this life we have received is activated through knowledge. And now he says, because you have refused to grow, you have refused to allow yourself to get the requisite level of spiritual knowledge and intelligence that makes for a victorious life. You can be alienated from the potential of the life of God. Please, for an example, um, may I request one of these uh, protocol? Can you help me with a bottle of water there? I just want to use it for an illustration. Thank you. Please look up. This is a bottle of water. This has the ability to quench thirst, true or false. Now, it is one thing to be given this. Do I have this now? I have it. I have been given. Gratitude to whoever gave it to me. But that does not mean I have enjoyed the blessings in it. I can be starving of thirst and yet I am holding that which sustains the ability because it takes intelligence. Now I have been given, but I must know how to open it so that I can now access it. Many believers have been holding this for years and praying and crying and saying, God, every time you read your Bible and you look at your life, you know something is wrong. It doesn't add up. And sometimes we just sweep it under the carpet and say, that's all right. My assignment this morning is to begin to open you up to what is wrong. Let God be true and all men liars. The level of defeat that is in the life of the average believer is not a testament of the victory that Jesus purchased on the cross. No. We sing about what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. We cry and we chant the many things. No. Up from the grave he arose. 
with the mighty triumph all his foe we say he arose the victor from the dark domain and we say he lives forever with his saints to reign remember what you've been singing with his saints he does not reign without his saints where is the dominion where is the excellence did the bible not say to permit your light to so shine before men that they may see your good deeds they will not see it as light they will see it as results he says and to glorify your father who is in heaven let me tell you this if we do not learn this i assure you we are going to lose a whole generation because there are many people especially the younger generation they are already getting frustrated you know um the time of our parents and respectfully speaking as god was helping us we're a generation that god has helped to be loyal even though whether we understand or not we follow in obedience but there is a generation right now that has options and until we propose the gospel that works i pray that a day will not come when jesus will be forgotten in our territories and i pray that when the generation of our fathers transit it will not be that there was once a time on the plateau that people used to call upon the name of the lord may god forbid it in jesus name but it will not just be by wishing we have to reintroduce the full counsel of god that makes for a victorious and an excelling life growth and maturity the bible says in galatians chapter 4 he says an heir for as long as he is a child that he differeth not from a slave even though he be lord of all thank you so much sir thank you hallelujah show us the ancient path will you lead us along eternal highway we want to follow the ways of jesus we want to enter your rest will you show us the ancient path will you lead us along eternal highway we want to follow the footsteps of jesus so the first tragedy for the believer who refuses to grow is that you will see the kingdom but never enter the kingdom the same way Moses saw Canaan from afar and yet never entered it we propose so many things about God in church today that we do not have the knowledge nor the intelligence to demonstrate when a student is in school especially in the high institution of learning before that student completes his program there is something called a defense is that true where they put together lecturers veterans in that field and the student is now asked along his his answers questions along that thought line to be able to gauge his understanding so far and until the student goes through that defense he's he's defending his understanding he's justifying why he should be allowed to go there are many believers who have failed that defense we stand before the gates of principalities and powers having come from several backgrounds of idol worship and we dare those gates and say open up and they say you are not the first to stand here your grandfather stood here your grandmother stood here based on what knowledge should the door open and we stand there in shock and remain there because everything happens by knowledge the moment you encounter jesus christ the very next assignment of the holy spirit in your life is to walk in partnership with the word of god and begin to open you up to the ways of god is called the mysteries of the kingdom hallelujah are we learning now this is very important hebrews chapter 5 please from verse 11 hebrews chapter 5 from verse 11 hebrews chapter 5 from verse 11 i read 11 to 14 is that it okay it says of whom 
we have many things to say and hard to be uttered seeing that ye are dull of hearing reading to 14 next verse please for when for the time ye ought to be teachers he says ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of god and are become such as have need of milk and not strong meat next verse for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness for he is a babe or he is a child next verse for strong meat he says belongs to them who are of full age who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil now please look up if I call two or three people here, lovingly speaking, and I ask you, how long have you been in church? You may say five years, two years. And I begin to ask you, teach me what you know about prayer. Teach me what you know about faith. Teach me what you know about character. Teach me what you know about Jesus. Teach me what you know about heaven. Teach me what you know about God desiring the believer to excel. You will be surprised how many believers will fail woefully. These are the indices that measure spiritual progress. There are six biblical foundations, doctrinal foundations for the believer. According to Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. There are six of them that Apostle Paul teaches us. And in fact, he calls them foundations. And he says, having exhausted this foundation, let us now go on to perfection that means there are still other things outside of that foundation can we read it together hebrews chapter 6 from verse 1 it says therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of christ let us go on on to perfection not laying again the foundation of number one repentance from dead works number two faith towards god next verse please number three be patient as we allow them pull it up of the doctrine of baptisms number four of laying on of hands number five of the resurrection of the dead number six of eternal judgment i say amen to the next verse and this we will do if god permits hmm. let us go on to perfection it is good to have the foundations right because if the foundation be destroyed the bible says what shall the righteous do but there is nobody who builds a foundation and begins to rejoice a foundation is powerful it's part of the component for a house but a foundation is not a house there are many other components is that true have you seen someone who would build a foundation and just rejoice and say, I have a beautiful house and invite everybody say, listen, don't worry about what you are not seeing. Just focus on the fact that there is a foundation here. Now, you cannot call us to celebrate Jesus over your spiritual life if all we see is foundation. We will tap you and clap for you and say, but this is not inviting enough. Unfortunately, in most cases, we don't see the foundation. What we see that brings the beauty is the superstructure. Is that true? You will hardly renovate a foundation. So the foundation is important. But many of us, you've gotten it right with the foundation. But can we move to be able to build that building? Because the Bible says we are like a spiritual house. And for a long time, many of us have allowed ourselves to be incomplete buildings. It says you are a city that is set on a hill. How do you build a city? Every city has foundations, but there has to be a structure. Unfortunately, the world that we live in, they are not spiritual largely. So they don't care about your foundation. They must see the structure that compels them to come to Jesus. Is God speaking to us? Right, very important. So, when we do not contend for growth and maturity, these are the things that we have at risk we are not able to step into the fullness of the character and the life of God now very quickly 
for this session, let me give us four biblical indices that measure growth and maturity. You can know right now in this conference whether you are matured or not. Number one, four biblical indices to measure our growth and maturity based on scripture. Are we ready? Number one, your degree of conformity. Please write. The first biblical index for measuring your growth and maturity in the kingdom is your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus in experience. Powerful. No matter what else you have that represents growth in order of priority, this is the first biblical index. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Jesus Christ in experience. That means if I look at your life, you don't have to tell me I've been a Christian for a long time. I, it, you should look like Jesus if you are truly his image. Please, please look at me. If you look at the mirror, what do you see there? You see the object. Is that true? The assignment of the mirror is to be a perfect reflection of the object. That means, and, and please, I, I hope that this does not trouble you, but that means if I look at your life, more than seeing a Yoruba man, more than seeing an Igbo man, more than seeing a plateau man, I should see one who heals from a kingdom whose foundation is not earthly. That means that you, have, you should have been so immersed in the life of Christ. I should be at a loss as to your geographic connection. If that does not happen, you are not growing. I shouldn't see you and say you are behaving like them. And without being prophetic, I can almost guess where you come from. Because you are still connected to the limitations of territory. Colossians chapter 3. A long reading. I'm not sure we'll have the liberty to stretch that far. But 1 to 15. Let's try and see how 5. The media works with us. We may be fast. Media, please help us. Grace for you in Jesus' name. So that we'll work together and we'll make it really fast. Colossians 3. And we'll begin our reading from verse 1. I want you to please follow carefully. Colossians 3, 1 to 15. It says, if ye then be risen with Christ. That means if it is true that this is a fact. Seek those things, it says, which are above where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Next verse. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. Now, he never said do not enjoy the things of the earth. But it says your affection. Are we together? Your focus must be on things above and not things that are in the earth. Why? For ye are dead, he says. Remember our definition of death? That means that you have been caught away from another life and you have been reconnected to another. You are dead and your life is hid with Christ and in God. Now the list begins. It says, when Christ who is our life shall appear, then we shall also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore. The word mortify means to deaden your members which are upon the earth. Let's read the list now. Ready? Number one, it says fornication. Number two, uncleanliness. Number three, inordinate affection. Are we together? Number four, all those long words there. Number five, covetousness, which is idolatry. So there are many idol worshippers. You don't need to have a small image in your house. The Bible says when you desire something is equal, their weight measured the same in the realm of the spirit. An idol worshipper and a covetous person are in the same group, spiritually speaking, he says. Next verse. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh upon the children of disobedience. Next verse. In the which ye also walked in some time when ye lived in them. But now put off all these. Believers, are we ready? Because he groups it into two. 
The first list looks very bad and immoral and many of us escape easily. Let's try this next set now. Put off these also. Are you ready? Anger. Wrath. Malice. Blasphemy. Filthy communication out of your mouth. Believers. Lie not to one another. Uh -huh. Seeing that ye have put off the old man. Remember, the water of the word is washing us now. Are we together now? Yes. Seeing that you have put on the old man with his deeds. Next verse. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. Are you seeing how the new, the new man is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him? Next verse, please. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Next verse. Put on therefore. So he tells you what to put off. And then he tells you what to put on. As the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, which is patience, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. You see immediately that they are not the same. You can forgive and not forbear. To forbear means to factor in the weakness of that individual and create a system of accommodation because it will happen again and again and again. If any have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, he says, as Christ forgave you, you too, please forgive. I can't see the verses. When we get to 15, please let me know. He says, above all this, hallelujah, put on love. King James says, charity, I like the word love and he calls it the bond of perfectness. Let's stop there. Your degree of conformity to the image and the character of Christ. Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5 to 7. Is God helping us this morning? Second Peter chapter 1 from verse 5 to 7. Second Peter. He says, and beside this, giving all diligence, Add to your faith virtue. The word virtue there means moral excellence. Add moral excellence to your faith. So don't just say, I am a man of faith. Congratulations. What have you added to it? Moral excellence, he says. And to moral excellence, add virtue. Add to virtue, to, to, to virtue knowledge. Next verse. And to knowledge, add self-control. Because the side effect of knowledge is pride. And to temperance, add patience. And to patience, godliness. Reading to seven. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love, which is charity. Hallelujah. He says, add to this. Add to this. Add to this. That means, in as much as it's fair to pat your back and say, wonderful, I think I've done well here. You must be sincere enough to say, have I added this? Have I added virtue to faith? Have I added knowledge? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. Now notice, notice that there is a difference between the gift of the Spirit and the fruit of the spirit are we together you can give a gift to a child you can even give a gift to an inanimate thing you can drop whatever it is a lower animal whatever it is but a fruit is proof that the tree has grown are we together now yes growth must happen before fruit bearing happens in a tree but the fruit of the spirit is this there's a version that says the fruit of the recreated human spirit is love in all of his various expressions. Then he begins to list this. But let's work with this. He says love, joy, peace, patience or long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. 
and then he makes a very striking statement he said against this there is no law do you know what this means he's not just talking about the old and new testament he's saying that anywhere you see human beings who need to coexist well there is no law that should fight this that means this is the ideal atmosphere for human beings to be able to live profitably this is not about spirituality you get dogs because you are looking for peace you lock your gates because you are looking for peace is that true all of the things that we look for in friends we look for in in employees we look for in in our children is simply an atmosphere that has a lavish display of the fruit of the spirit without living in this atmosphere you will die that your spirit was only designed to be alive when it finds itself in this atmosphere where there is love there is peace why do you go on vacation you are attempting to simulate this atmosphere are we together? Yes. Your name should not be the first reason why people suspect you are a Christian. John, Ruth, Deborah, Hannah. If you have to tell people your name for them to know you are a Christian, you are not a Christian enough. Are we together? That the moment you open your mouth and communicate, in fact, your very persona should have been so absorbed into the life of God that when people look at you, before they say you are a preacher, before they say you are a businessman, a lecturer, a career person, their first verdict and conclusion about you should be this man is truly the child of God. My greatest testimony, the testimony I covet, is that at the end of my life, it shouldn't be that people say, this man is this, a great man, you did this and that. Those things are, they honestly don't mean anything to me. I covet the testimony of Enoch. The Bible says, and Enoch walked with God. Not walked for God. You can walk for God and not walk with God. You can give to the house of God and not walk with God. You can preach for God. You can do business for God and yet not walk with God. The character of the Spirit finding expression. My charge to us this morning in light of this first biblical index for spiritual maturity is that we must be sincere and look at our lives can i truly say the character of the spirit is finding expression in my life what is what is the the report card from my place of work among my contemporaries my spouse my children in church i'm not talking of eye service I'm talking of genuine spiritual growth. That people look at you today and they can say he may be any other thing else but I know that this one is true. He's a Christian. When John was speaking about John the Baptist, he said there was a man sent from God. He never associated him with his earthly his, his, his earthly origin again. He said, this man, he's demonstrated something that is not earthly. There was a man sent from God. Years ago, I went to preach. It was for a crusade in Kano. And while I was preaching and ministering, I ministered to a dear mother and this woman came out to be prayed for and when I looked at this woman the you could see someone who was an epitome of a genuine Christian the life and the energy that flowed from this woman was compelling 
And then the woman told me something. She said, by the privilege of God's grace, held her house her Bible, and she finishes the whole Bible every 15 days. I said, who should pray for who now? How do you start praying for this woman? What am I going to tell God to do? Believe me, especially for those of us who have the privilege of being in the ministry of the gospel, people don't care how sound you are preaching or what kind of thing. They want to know that you are a genuine child of God. That is the most important thing first. And before you are happy that I'm talking about preachers alone, this involves every other person too. You can't say, I'm not a preacher, so I am allowed to do my own thing. Mm -mm. This is a call to higher levels of spirituality where your life and your character becomes a true reflection of Jesus. Listen, let me tell you this. When people look at your life, you should be what Paul calls a living epistle. Do you know what that means? A living epistle means that if somebody forgot to do his morning devotion, the moment he looks at you, you become a continuation of what he was reading. That your life literally is a scripture explaining many things about God. So if he was reading, say, about the fruit of the Spirit and he had to rush for work and now he's feeling guilty that I did not read my Bible, the moment he sees you, you become a consolation because he can continue to read his Bible as he looks at you. What do people read when they look at you? For many people, they read a novel, a nasty one that says, this person is not a child of God. For someone, they read and they see that this is a child of God that is easily given to compromise. This is true for politicians. This is true for businessmen. This is true for career people. It is true for all believers. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. Salaska de Bashkana Kata Branda Katekatos. Kate Branda Katapa Kotosko to break a take and the The phase of development. Lord, grant me the discipline.